Mr. So Bernard Radhika Monica requests all of you to respond so that we find the right set of energy to start the day because uh, we will have right. We'll have to sustain this energy all through the day because there are some amazing conversations for all of us to take from. Okay, so uh, the first thing I would like to start with is the fact that uh, usually whenever you participate in any conference of sorts, they will make sure that the, the dignitaries or the VVIPs are invited on stage to light the lamp. But here, we don't take a slight detour, but we're not changing the idea altogether. We are in fact inviting the rights of the VVIPs on the stage to light the lamp. In fact, we are calling who we have titled the change makers to come on stage to light the lamp because they are the ones who are taking all the discussions to reality. They're converting all the ideas to action on the ground. Okay, so uh, I would request the Shravya Reddy, Vamshi Krishna Madhuri and Sirisha to please come up on stage to light the lamp. And without you, I don't think we will be starting this in the best way possible. So request uh, Shravya, Vamsi Krishna and Sirisha to please come up on stage to light the lamp so that we are able to start the Development Dialogue 2023 at Linda Summer. Thank you. You say.
theme of this uh, development dialogue. Uh, we'll have, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, later in the panel we'll talk about how, uh, how did the foundation use uh, technology to increase impact. Right now I have uh, uh, fantastic uh, panelists, uh, three of them from very different uh, backgrounds and all of them using technology to uh, increase impact, uh, to take, uh, to, to impact the last uh, mile. So first the panel is uh, Sudha. Let's welcome Sudha. From the Nudge Foundation, uh, their mission is to nudge uh, top talent in the country to solve uh, the biggest problems in the country. Uh, their big focus is to alleviate poverty uh, in, the life, in their lifetime uh, by focusing on livelihood. Uh, Sudha is an MBA from IIM Lucknow. Pleasure to have you here, Sudha. Please. So next, my next panelist is a big uh, corporate guy, uh, Anjani. Anjani is the Chief Digital Officer of HDFC Bank. And, uh, in India's uh, advances in financial services are uh, really uh, taking services to the uh, uh, to the poor and the needy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, it is graduate from IIT Kharagpur and uh, from IIM Calcutta. And my last panelist is uh, Raja Gayam. Uh, he is the entrepreneur in the panel. He is the founder of uh, uh, Biliti. Biliti is the world's largest home. The pictures here. They are Hyderabad and uh, has really done a fantastic work. His almost you can all across the world. Uh, they sell in 15. Sorry. So in saying, don't forget the tea hub link, they are incubated in tea hub. One of the very, very uh, successful uh, startups from, from our own very uh, tea hub. Welcome, Raja. Okay. We started out with a vision to take technology to solve problems of basic human needs, not just lucrative problems, just communities. It's simply mind-blowing. No different from cutting-edge tech in any other sector. To give a few examples, a lot of what we struggle with as a country today is access to rights that have been given to its citizens constitutionally. And one of those is the Forest Rights Act that gives particularly vulnerable tribal groups access to forests for their own livelihoods. In this space today, we have cutting edge technology using geospatial satellite maps, uh, using cadastral maps that kind of are what we use to find our navigation through cities and using Google Maps or whatever. But that technology today is helping farmers get their rights to use the non timber produce of forests for their own land needs. We have startups working. Uh, to monetize voice, capturing voices again of these particularly vulnerable tribal groups uh, for AI and that becomes a revenue stream for people with education levels of even fourth grades minus. They own the royalty to their voice and that gets monetized uh, to be sold you know, uh, by leading tech giants across the world. Now to do this you need innovators. If this technology exists, it serves every other segment. But to take it to the bottom of the pyramid requires innovators. It requires purpose-seeking capital. A continuum of capital all the way from very early stage seed capital to scale-up capital. And an ecosystem that will ensure that these innovations get scaled within public systems, that governments are able to adopt these uh, and that's kind of the fascinating times that we live in. We're excited to be part of So, this is pretty good. So, what you're seeing is how tribal rights uh, for forests. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think uh, it's, it's, it's very, very nice to hear that. Yeah. Uh, Anjali, uh, what do you? Technology has become very, very important. Today, we have reached a level where any citizen of this country 
can open a savings account, take a personal loan or take a credit card, make payments digitally standing anywhere in this country. All that person needs is a mobile phone with a connectivity. As long as that is available, the person can be financially included. And I'll just take, take a couple of examples. Imagine that you are in a rural part of this country with a mobile phone and you are an individual person. You want to open an account. You just go to an app, click on it. It asks you for some details like your Aadhaar number, PAN card, etc. And it reaches the video KYC position from where a bank officer appears on the phone, does a KYC for you and opens a full KYC account on your phone which is ready to use instantly. Yes. Likewise, personal loan can be given. Uh, you can call the contact center and speak in vernacular and get to know what your balance is. Uh, you no more have to go only to a website of a bank. You can just open your WhatsApp and you are able to do full banking on WhatsApp also in your vernacular language. So technology is actually, actually extending the reach of banking beyond banking. Just goes beyond the brick and mortar. Nice, nice. Of that, uh, it's uh, it doesn't even appear uh, as a strange thing to open a bank account without even going to a bank uh, in India any longer, which is like a miracle probably in other countries. Uh, we've come really so far, so quickly uh, in India, and uh, I think uh, banks have really become uh, tech banks. Uh, have transformed themselves to tech enabled banks in no time. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, 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 the bus TV, uh, right? And uh, you are really uh, 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 a pioneer in that. Uh, so, what what is the difference? Uh, like, what is the difference that EV has made uh, uh, to a common man? I'm happy to be here. Uh, and uh, uh, Nizambad has been very kind to me. This is my second experience of Kartika Sandbox. So, thanks for the opportunity. In terms of what we do, I think uh, tech plays a key role in terms of not just manufacturing of the vehicle, the technology is like lithium ion batteries and swappable batteries that go into the vehicle. Uh, but at the core of it, uh, the customer requirements as well as uh, uh, solving people problems are, are, the core, uh, are at the core of this, uh, uh, what we do. And uh, when it comes to uh, really having an impact, uh, so I'll give you one or two examples of where we operate and how it has been impactful to uh, some of the common people. Uh, so one of the areas where we are primarily present in the last mile delivery space, where in companies like Amazon, Big Basket, IKEA and various other players use our uh, vehicles for last mile delivery. Prior to our vehicles, they were using either four wheelers or uh, two wheelers and most of the two wheeler drivers, you would have seen them carrying huge amounts of load on their back. It's a very painful process and by doing that, uh, uh, they, they get into health issues and uh, they do not have a lot of time for uh, their family because they are always under, under the pressure to deliver certain number of goods. So there we have been extremely instrumental in uh, converting most of the bikers towards a vehicle which is much more protected from the sun, rain and various other elements. Not only that, it can carry a lot more volume so that means uh, uh, instead of doing multiple dead trips, we went from the hub picking up packages on their back, you can carry all the packages at the same time, deliver uh, in a timely manner and then come back. So that has been huge in terms of uh, the uh, health, uh, the take home salary that they are able to take as well as uh, uh, improvement in terms of their life. The second area where we have uh, seen a lot of impact is most of the small businesses, whether in India or whether in uh, uh, Europe or US where we correctly export our products, they have been severely affected by COVID and most of them had to shut down their uh, shops. So these are small coffee shops or uh, refrigeration units where they have groceries and all. So what we have is a mobile, uh, mobile uh, unit where you, your entire coffee equipment or uh, the refrigeration equipment is powered from the vehicle itself. So you do not have any uh, requirement for a physical shop, right? You can have a mobile shop that can be taken to various locations. It can actually come into this conference room and start, uh, start serving coffee or uh, beverage uh, drinks to others. So that's the kind of impact that we have seen with uh, small businesses. Doesn't end there. So even with uh, updates, uh, one of the main issues for any of the corporates in the last mile delivery space is the attrition rate. So a person only works for about two or three months at a point from there. 
they'll be lucky if they work for two or three months. The main reason for that is uh, the delivery boys are always under constant pressure. That's because uh, uh, they, they are expected to deliver certain number of products. And a bike is not really a, a, a built for them. So, so using a three-wheeler, they are able to uh, reduce the admission rate uh, from the uh, delivery people. So that's for the large corporates. And of course, they are able to reduce their CO2 emissions, which, is, which everyone knows. Uh, yeah. So, uh, if we touch upon the point uh, saying that, yes, uh, but technology is expensive, how do we get, uh, like, how do you see, like, how do you find uh, the people in the social sector uh, who are trying to use technology to increase the scale of impact? Uh, could you give some uh, insights on that? Uh, so, I think there's very large currently have government services in education or health. Uh, what the country is able to spend today is somewhere between one and a half to two percent of GDP on educating its youth. That finite amount of funding, which is very small compared to most development co developing countries, which are in the five to six percent, developed countries spend upwards of eight percent on education. India only has less than 2% of GDP to spend on education. That money can go much farther with the use of technology. So there's no dispute there. But how much capital is available for something as important as education in the innovation stages? Right? If you are to bring to life technology that will accelerate learning in classrooms, improve learning levels, build capacity of children to be grade appropriate, there's very little, there's very little risk capital for innovation, even though there is huge OPEX for delivery once something is good. So I think what we need to put into place is a system that offers us continuum of funding all the way from very early stage make it possible for innovators in large numbers to start looking at basic pyramid problems. And from among them, start betting bigger on the better ideas, the high potential ideas. Unlock funding for growth stages and eventually leverage the scale-up capital that government has to make this become real for the millions of children across the country. Like an example, in this example of education, in a school, right, whether it is affordable public health, whether it's livelihoods, whether it's improving access to credit, access to markets for silk farmers in the east or freshwater fisheries in say inland Telangana uh, or coastal Telangana. This is a massive need bring India into the 21st century as a global player that has equitable, uh, inclusive development, very different from how the rest of the world is developed. Uh, so so for uh, the impact sector, it's a lot of uh, uh, like uh, uh, new talent probably comes to you with uh, the very good fortune of working with 100 plus tech non-profit startups since we started back in 2017. And all of this has been funded through a mix of very progressive CSR donors. So Corporate India is the funder of our work. Our earliest funders were emphasis in Cisco, and since then we've had uh, up to 10 corporates that have helped us run these programs. For very early stage ideas, we run an incubator program with a innovation grant of 15 lakhs. As ideas get open and betting on the most high potential entrepreneurs, we're able to give out grants up to two crores in our accelerator program. Wow. This is the stage at which it has grown beyond the program. It has taken the shape of an organization with a strong board and governance, with a strong CXO team beyond the founder and have developed a theory of scale beyond just a theory of change. 
And this is also the point where we are able to start connecting them to state governments, uh, where government is the agent of change, or through other collaborators in the private sector and unlock commercial capital for their ideas if the market-based uh, approach is what they have chosen to take. Fantastic. That's another uh, good uh, uh, intervention from the government. So government has actually said that CSR money would be used to fund uh, innovation. Uh, uh, so that and, uh, you are using it to actually fund your innovators in the sector. Uh, yeah, we we'll want to actually, uh, actually you could you actually came in. And, yeah. Yes, that, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, a lot of underwriting in, uh, in Gujarat, there are milk societies where farmers go and carry milk and pour every day. Now, if those guys want to, let's say, want to invest in livestock, they want to buy a couple of cattle, uh, it ranges from 50,000 to and a half lakh to 3 lakh. We don't have any civil data or experience data to underwrite. So we take the data of milk pouring which is happening in that society. If that data is available, it is enough for us to give a visibility into the cash flow of that particular farmer. And we are able to underwrite. So we have been underwriting a lot of homes like that in the recent past. Um, just extending the same thing is also, there is a small shopkeeper, let's say in Azamabad, who needs working capital. Now as long as the cash flow information of the shopkeeper is available, we are able to do underwriting. And the big way open is trying to do the same, which is going to open up a huge market for people who do not have credit information to begin with, but they can generate and build that market of them. Credit products for future. Absolutely. Uh, uh, thanks so much. Actually, at the foundation, uh, we build we, we a huge uh, capex. Uh, uh, and now uh, the foundation is embarked uh, on a journey to uh, make a one lakh pound uh, box. Right? And I can relate it so well. Uh, now, for that scale, we need to get institutional uh, money. Right? And you can't find uh, if somebody has not done the experiment to make it sustainable to get you the data which uh, uh, gives you the confidence that you could fund it, uh, right? Uh, and uh, the foundations really work over the last 10 years to uh, put that thing uh, in place. And now uh, I, you are the uh, HDRC trying to come forward to uh, fund that and that's a massive scale, 100,000 
So it's that ecosystem that has been extremely helpful uh, like enabling us to access the world as a uh, market for our products. Nice, nice, nice. Uh, good that uh, uh, you, I mean, uh, mentioned about the hub. Uh, right, again, that's again a common intervention. Uh, right, I mean, you said it all started there. A common focus on innovation, common focus on using technology. Gathering. There is not a gathering where 
in the same mix of crowd, you will find farmers, you will find open micro entrepreneurs, you will find corporates, you will find startups, you will find faculties, you will find government, you will find all sort of you know, uh, representatives of all stakeholders. Now, so I want you to at least ensure that you talk to one of these and get one story out for yourself. So if you meet one farmer, get one story, one woman, my entrepreneurs, get one story, meet one startup, meet one corporate, or somebody who wants to do social good, then I think the true purpose of development dialogue will be successful. Now, this is not a gathering that we are just randomly put together. This is a very unique community that Kakitiya Sandbox has built over the last nine years. We have built it brick by brick. And that's the gathering here. I fondly remember a story from a program that we do, it's called Skill and Village, where we used to run this program for two, three years. And after two, three years of running this program, the Sarpanch came to us saying that I would like to write a check for 25,000 rupees and then be part of this program to make it sustainable, to make it viable. Now that's the community that has gathered here. The community that truly wants to be part of economic transformation of North Telangana. Overall, over the nine years, Kakitiya Sandbox has been able to generate $50 million of economic impact for 100,000 families. We work with 100,000 farmers, 5,000 micro-entrepreneurs, more than 2,000 skilling students and numerous startups. And all of that has done right here in from Nizamabad for the social impact of North Telangana. Sometimes people ask me, what am I doing here? While all of this is happening, how are you the center of it? You have the profile to be in some tech center around the world. You graduated from NIT to G. You are in the corporate sector. You are working with different governments. Why are you here in Nizamba? To them, I humbly say that if the pursuit of purpose and happiness can take people to the higher Himalayas, this is my purpose. And I am just happy to be here. You know where you will find an opportunity to work with a farmer who is so smart and always thinks through the first principle people who are the philosophers of the world and the best thinkers of the world. That opportunity is rare to come by. So if any one of you among the crowd is thinking of taking that hard plunge to make this social impact, I am happy to share my experience, talk on the side and I will tell you just one phrase. It's all worth it if you take that plunge and actually do that work. Uh, then at last I personally believe that's all about people. People is what create impact, people is what bring the change. So today, I would say, let the shoulders drop and inspiration fly to all of you again. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to our own very own rock star. Okay, now the, uh, the next person I'm going to be introducing honestly requires my introduction, but as part of the job, I'm quickly the nominal to have you here today. He was a former CEO of Sierra Atlantic, a company that grew to be the best in class global service company over a period of 17 years before being acquired by Hitachi. All the fancy designations, but the designation that he absolutely loves is when he's called the chief volunteer for Kakadia Sandbox. So, please put your hands together, Officer Raju Red.
the smallest city in the world with a Thai chapter anywhere and one of the most vibrant Thai chapter cities. Absolutely. So I think that's an example of bottom-up form of socio-economic development. Second is bringing an entrepreneurial mindset to address social challenges. As Desh, the founder, often likes to say, if you can combine the compassion of the non-profit world with the execution excellence of the for-profit world, that's when you get outstanding results. And third is scale. You know, a country of a billion people, you know, unless you touch a large enough population, you can't make a meaningful difference over time. So we started with roughly about 10 million population, the undivided districts of Nizamabad, Karimnagar and Vedak initially. But today I would say our impact region is roughly about 1% of India. Because we also operate in Nalgonda and Adilabad, most of North Telangana today. And we touch about 2 lakh people, out of which uh, 5 lakh, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, uh, 20 lakhs, 2 million people, 20 lakhs, out of which 5 lakhs is a life altering impact where their uh, income has gone up by 50 percent to sometimes 2 to 3x. Now that is still a long way off from where we uh, strive to be, but it's a very encouraging progress and at the end of it, it's all about building role models at the micro level, people that they can relate to, like my uh, the KPR guy who will, you know, all the uh, businesses that have come to, global businesses that have come to Hyderabad and Telangana in recent years. And I think uh, there was a lot uh, that came out of Davos conference itself. My understanding is there is several billions of dollars, maybe tens of billions, uh, uh, that have come to uh, Telangana or will be coming as a result of that. So, I don't have to tell you, about it. so some of you may have heard it before, so bear with me. Uh, it's a personal story, I think, that gives you a glimpse into, you know, uh, Akedia. And uh, this was about six years ago. I was uh, meeting, uh, KDR got a meeting. Uh, he invited me to join him uh, for a dinner at Palaknama Palace, uh, where there was a visiting delegation from Boeing. And, uh, and he was kind enough, and I said, sure, I mean, that sounds interesting. So, Boeing was evaluating different cities for setting up their India for the first time. And we talked about, you know, each other, and uh, he knew that I live in California, I was here for why Boeing should choose Hyderabad over other cities, and, you know, other cities not just in India, but, you know, outside too. And at the end of it, this gentleman turns to me and says, you know, Raju, we need a leader like this back in our country, in America. from personal anecdote that I have, he's a kind of leader that not only any part of India would love to have, but any democracy in the world would love to have. So please join me in uh, uh, a warm welcome to our chief guest, Katie Arkar. Thank you all. Firstly, I'd like to thank uh, Raju Reddy, the team of faculty at Sandbox for inviting us uh, over to Islamabad. It's always a pleasure, always, uh, always uh, you know, uh, a memorable experience meeting with uh, Raju, Desh, and the entire team uh, you know, that inspired this wonderful facility being created here in uh, Islamabad, the Kakatiya Sandbox. Also, wanted to ensure, uh, you know, uh, to all the distinguished delegates and others who have come from various parts of the world and also various parts of India. Welcome to Telangana, welcome to Islamabad. Our Honorable Minister for Roads and Buildings, Sri Prashant Reddy, the District President of Islamabad, Sri Jeevan Reddy, Honorable Chairman for RTC and MLA Islamabad Rural, Sri Bajrani Gowardhan Garu, Honorable MLA Islamabad Arvan, Sri Ganesh Gupta Garu, Honorable MLA uh, Bodhan, Sri Shakil Garu, Honorable Member of Raj Sabha, former speaker Sri Sukhaya Suresh Vidigar, Honorable MLC D. Rajeshwar Rao Garu, Honorable MLC Gangadhar Gaur Garu, Honorable ZB Chairman Mittal Rao Garu, Honorable MLA from Mahmodar Sri Malaya Yadha Garu, Honorable former MLC Sri Narsi Reddy Garu, Honorable DCCB Chairman Sri Bhaskar Reddy Garu, to all the distinguished uh, you know, members who are also present in the audience to the district 
administrators, officials, to my friends from media, warm welcome to all of you. I love the theme of this uh, uh, event, Development Dialogue. I think uh, a country like India, you know, which has the largest population on the planet now, we just surpassed China. Those of you who are not aware, we just, I think, surpassed China last week or 10 days ago. We have the largest population on the planet now, in the country with the largest population on the planet. Most importantly, this population, if you look at 50% of India is less than the age of 27. 65% of India is less than the age of 35. And in a knowledge economy, I think this is the biggest nation can bring to the table. The kind of young think force, not young work force, the kind of young think force India possesses today is the biggest strength in fact it can leverage days to come. The reason why I said uh, I love the theme of this conference being event and dialogue is because I'll narrate a quick story to you. Back in 1987, both India and China, similar sized countries in terms of population, also had a similar sized economy. We had almost the same GDP back in 1987. But if you actually move forward to 36 years later, today, China is the second largest economy in the world with 60 trillion dollars of GDP size. Whereas India is still languishing at 3 trillion dollars with the dreams of a 5 trillion economy. What went wrong? Or what did China do right that India, India did not get right? In my humble opinion, I think China focused on ensuring that development becomes the principal conversation across the country, across the nation. Unfortunately, in India, I think very often politics takes center stage and economics, unfortunately, takes a back seat. Now, the reason why I said I love the theme of the conference here is because the conversation which always centers around development, especially for a third world country like India, for an emerging economy like India, will only ensure that the policy makers, the lawmakers, the legislators, the elected representatives, their focus should remain on the right things. For instance, in Telangana, under the dynamic leadership of our Honorable Chief Minister, Sri KCR Dhan, we have focused on getting our basics right. Back in 2014, right about the time when Kakatiya sandbox was formed, the state of Telangana also came into being on the 2nd of June 2014. When we started this journey to new state, there were a lot of apprehensions, there were lots of doubts. In fact, we started our journey as a power deficit. You know, state of Telangana, in fact, when uh, Manish was, when Fani was talking, also when uh, Raju was talking, they all mentioned farmers and the rural livelihoods, etc. In Telangana, for those of you who are not familiar with this state, we had, after the formation of the state, we had 25 lakh plus, 2.5 million plus cube wells that have been sunk in by the farming community here. Spending billions and billions of dollars over a period of last few decades, they have sunk in many, many bore wells into the entire dry region of Telangana. While there is enough water in our rivers Godavari and Krishna, it has not been leveraged. While there are enough minor irrigation tanks, almost 46,000 lakes and tanks, they have not been leveraged. Irrigation was primarily rain-fed and it was dependent on tube wells and bore wells. Now this is something that was the biggest challenge when we started our journey as a new state. Because we started our journey as a power deficit state. When our Honorable Chief Minister assumed office on the 2nd of June 2014, he made it his primary and primary challenge to address this power deficit situation. In a matter of six months, just six months, from the day he assumed office, he made sure that the power deficit situation has changed. And today, I can proudly say that Telangana is a power surplus state which can actually supply electricity 24 by 7 to the farming community free of cost in India. And we are the only state in India which provides free power 24 by 7 to the farmers. We also produce and, uh, and supply quality power to both domestic and also industry sector in our state. The reason why I am mentioning this today is because 
in the last eight and a half years, numbers will tell you a story. The development dialogue that we are talking about today is already work in progress in Telangana. When we started our journey, the per capita income of Telangana was 1,24,000 rupees. 124,000 rupees. As of March last year, March 2022, the per capita of Telangana has risen, has increased to 278,000 rupees, 278,000 rupees. Almost 130 percent increase. The gross state domestic product, the GSDP of Telangana was about 500,000, uh, 5 lakh crores as on 20, 2014 June 2nd. But as of last year, the GSDP of Telangana also has increased to 11.55 lakh crore, which is almost 1.15 million, uh, 1.15 million. The kind of increase in wealth, the kind of increase in per capita income that has happened in Telangana, just to, just to give you one little statistic that put things in perspective. Telangana is only half percent of India in terms of population. We are only 40 million people. But our contribution to India's economy, India's GDP, is 5%. We are 2.5% in terms of population, but our contribution is 5%, which means we are literally punching double our weight. We are a 50 kilo boxer fighting in 100 kilo categories, how I would like to I would also like to add one more thing. Raju called Nizamabad microcosm of India. And by extension, you call this room microcosm of the world. I would only say one thing. Telangana is that state where the north of India meets the south of India. Telangana is that state where Paratha meets Dosa. Telangana is that state where biology meets technology. Telangana is that state where life sciences meets data sciences. Telangana is that state where mango verse meets metaverse. Telangana also is that state which is focused, which is focused extensively on holistic integrated development. What do I mean by that? Our IT exports back in 2014 were 57,000 crores. As of last year, they have to 1,83,000 crores. Our agriculture activity has expanded by almost 6% in terms of our GSP valuation. It has increased by 119% overall. For those of you who have a phone in your hand, let me indulge you for a second. Please pull out your phone for a second. Please pull out your phone. And please Google it for me. World's largest lift irrigation project. Let me repeat world's largest lift irrigation project. Can somebody tell me the answer? Who's got trigger happy and put quick figures? I would like to hear from the back which is here. What is it? Kaleshwaram lift irrigation project. The reason why I mention it, but we often, very often we talk about Chinese execution. Very often we talk about how three quarter dam is built by the Chinese in a record span of time. Let me tell you, youngest state in India, under the leadership of our dynamic chief minister, Sri KCR Daru, has built the world's largest lift irrigation project in a span of four years. Indian engineers, the engineers of Telangana, have made us proud. We have built this project which irrigates 45 lakh acres of land which is also rejuvenated the Sri Ram Sagar project right here in the, in, the Zambad, in the neck of the woods in Nizamabad. And most importantly, it also caters to industrial consumption and it also supplies drinking water to the metro city of Hyderabad, which contributes a significant portion of our GSDP. I am not sure how many of you know this. Not only is Telangana home to the world's largest drinking water, uh, world's largest lift irrigation project. India recently completed 75 years of independence. We are the first state to have completed a mammoth, a Herculean task of providing a portable drinking water connection to each and every one of our one crore households under a project called as Mission Bagira. We are the first state to have completed it. And when we were laying the water pipeline which almost ran for more than 100,000 kilometers, 1 lakh kilometers plus, 
a water pipeline, along with it 19,000 reservoirs and along with it number of pump houses and everything else that goes with it. Let me also tell you, we have leveraged, you know there is a very popular word in India called Jugaad. Jugaad basically means hustle. Jugaad basically means hustle. What we did in Telangana is something ingenious. When we were, when we had to dig and trench the entire landscape and lay almost 100,000 plus kilometers of pipeline, we decided that we'll also combine the fiber optic cable in the same trench that we were digging for the water pipeline. Thereby, Telangana will also become one of the first states in India to be providing 100 Mbps broadband connection to each and every one of our 10 groups. This is because the pandemic has shown us what can be done by way of e-commerce, by way of e-health, by way of digital education and by way of digital empowerment at large. So my humble request to those of you who are not familiar with the brilliant story of Telangana, that is the reason why I call my state the most successful startup of independent India in the last 75 years. I can narrate many more than other fantastic achievements in the state, but I'll leave it at that because I know we're short of time and we already showed up late. So let me thank Raju and the entire team of Kakatiya Sandbox for this wonderful opportunity. I wish the youngsters, the farmers, the entire ecosystem of Nizamabad the very best. I'm coming back next month, Raju Anna. I'm coming back to inaugurate the IT hub here. I'll humbly request you and this. Lovely request you and Desh to bring in more and more because you know the pandemic has shown us it doesn't matter where you work from in the world. You could be in a village, you could be in a small town, you could be in a metro like Hyderabad or Bangalore. I think now in a digitally connected world, in a world where youngsters from tier 2 towns actually have more fire in their belly, we need to ensure that the rural innovators, the social innovation, the tier 2 town innovators from Nizamabad, Amam, Nalgon, Mahbub Nagar are all given ample opportunity and equal opportunity to ensure we create a level playing field. So I thank you for this opportunity. I thank all of you for fact giving me this opportunity. And once again, welcome to the Asian Fireside chat as well. Now, there are very few people in the country who can spontaneously captivate an audience. And then we have uh, one household which has two of them. So, all of us know who I'm talking about. Please put your hands together. Now, now, it's going to indulge all of us in a fireside chat with KTR Garu, asking all the questions that we have in mind. Only for you, KTR. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, you know, first of all, I want to congratulate you on how much you have accomplished at a young age. You know, just looking at your Wikipedia, and I realized that I graduated and left India in 1973 when you were not born yet. So, congratulations on getting so much done at a young age. You know, like you talked about, Telangana has achieved a lot in the last eight years. Double the GDP, clean water, all these things. What were the core aspects of being able to achieve those fantastic results? And what do you think Telangana as a state needs to do to keep that trajectory going for the next eight? Thank you, Desh. Great question. Firstly, uh, like uh, the MC said, with a name like Desh, that's what you've done in Hooghly, has today translated into something very meaningful here in Islamabad. Firstly, I think Desh and his entire team of Hooghly Sandbox really deserve a big round of applause to put your hands together. Thank you. And I'm sure Jayashree's role is more paramount than this, so thank you Jayashree. I think uh, for contributing in a big way to this, uh, this uh, brilliant story. Just to, you know, uh, kind of add to what I was saying before, Telangana has done some things which are truly meaningful and truly relevant to an emerging and a developing country like India. The reason why I said uh, the dialogue needs to be centered around development and nothing else is because, you know, as a country, I think we've lost the plot somewhere. Now, we are not focused on ensuring that our, ch our children, our citizens get the basics right. You know, we need electricity, we need drinking water, 
we need water to the fields of our farmers, we need to ensure basic support mechanisms are in place to make agriculture more remunerative, to ensure that the farmers, kin and their children also look at farming as a productive sector, not otherwise. We have focused on these bases. What can be done? What further can be done? I think if you look around uh, you know, the world and also India at large, I was at the World Economic Forum last week. One of the prominent themes that kept popping up over and over is, you know, with the whole geopolitical situation, how, you know, the world now realized that they are excessively dependent on China. The world has started taking stock of the situation and wants to move away cautiously but slowly away from China. There's a whole China plus one talk, there's a whole China for China and you know, rest being done elsewhere kind of a discussion. This is India's opportunity, you know, this is, it. This is an opportunity for India to seize the movement, to capitalize on it, to build more manufacturing, to ensure that we, you know, also as we move into the services and knowledge economy, to latch on to that unique opportunity where India can position itself as a hybrid between China and the US. The reason why I call it a hybrid between China and the US is because China has done brilliantly to position itself as a factory of the world. They produce everything literally. They produce active pharmaceutical ingredients, they produce world class electronics, they produce plastic bowels, you know, little things that we see all around us. They also produce some of the most high tech equipment that there is in the world that is used in aerospace, defense, space state, etc. etc. Whereas the US slowly but steadily has moved away from being a manufacturing to a services now to a knowledge economy. That's like I was pointing out, I think over the next one decade, India can fully position itself with progressive states like Telangana leading from the front. India can fully position itself as that unique combination which can both cater to the manufacturing needs of the world, also at the same time ensuring that this young think force that we have, that amazing demographic dividend that can pay off big time, if we ensure that more and more sandboxes can come up in various parts of India, if we can focus and ensure that the youth of India doesn't necessarily get distracted from the development agenda, continues to stay on course, then magic can happen over the next one decade. The last thing I'll mention on this count, Adesh, India does not have the luxury of leapfrogging anymore. We cannot allow leapfrogging to happen. We have to literally pole vote. Because what US was able to achieve in the last, say, one century or so, what China was able to achieve and accomplish in the last two decades or so, India has to do that in one decade. That is the window of opportunity that India cannot miss out. More and more such unique opportunities where ecosystem and multilateral you know, uh, cooperation opportunities between the government, the private sector, the academia. If this kind of, kind of conversations can happen more often, the tangible outcomes, the tangible metrics, then surely India will actually get onto that uh, uh, proper, proper direction, proper dialogue. No, I totally agree with you. Also, I'm a big believer in democracy. You know, it's a messy, it's a very messy process. But it has an ability to include everybody and to the inclusive growth. In fact, I remember in 1980s and 90s, somehow there was a feeling that Japan had won and the US was going to lose. And it's amazing though, and the geopolitics, of, which is one of the most complex technologies. So the fact that they can master these things, I totally agree with you. How important do you think is the inclusive growth to be able to achieve the dream? This democracy is good, I completely agree with you. But demagoguery is good. Democracy is possibly our greatest asset, besides the thing force that I just talked about. But demagoguery and you know, insulting our institutions, insulting our own people, dividing people in the name of religion, etc., etc., can never make India, uh, you know, can never propel India to the first world orbit. What can I, you know, the inclusive growth opportunity that you just discussed, that you just mentioned? You know, I, I firmly believe in three ideas. Honorable Prime Minister had called all the political party representatives a couple of years back for a dialogue. I told him one thing on behalf of uh, my party, the Bharat Rashtra Samiti. 
I told him, sir, the three I mantra needs to be followed. First I is innovation. Second I is infrastructure. Third I is inclusive growth. Unless you mix these three I's and come out with a very unique model, because if you think about it, young Indians today, you know, with the kind of access they have, we are all drowning in information, but you know, like they say, we are all, you know, uh, grasping for knowledge and grasping, clutching for uh, wisdom ideas. Young Indians today are, have access to information, have amazing uh, ability to also solve the world's problems. They have stars in their eyes, they have the ability to really come out and, you know, aim big in the globe and, you know, solve the global issues. Provided we give them platforms to actually, provided we give them wings to their dreams. So in Telangana, we founded what is called as T Hub, which is the world's largest technology incubator now. Not only did we find the T Hub, not, not only did we uh, uh, set up the T Hub, today Telangana is uniquely positioned with women entrepreneurship hubs called as the V Hub. We also have created TSIC, Telangana State Innovation Cell. In fact, Fani is here. He was our chief innovation officer of the of the state of Telangana for a very long period. I'm thankful to him for that. And also. We have created a number of institutions, including a very important institution called as TAS, the Telangana Academy for Skills and Knowledge. Unless you have your youngsters gearing up for the opportunities the world is going to present to you, unless you are able to latch on to them, unless you are able to actually, you know, leverage that opportunity, you will not be able to do much. So innovation and the kind of platform government can create as an enabler is extremely important. Infrastructure is equally important. The fact that today you can travel from Hyderabad to Nizamabad in about three hours, probably in days to come with high speed rail connectivity in half an hour's time, is what is going to be a game changer. Then it doesn't matter where you live and where you work. You could be living in Bangalore and working in Hooghly, you could be living in Nizamabad and working in Hyderabad. So the kind of infrastructure that India needs as a country is something that governments and private sector both have to focus on. Not only national highways, rapid rail connectivity, also ensuring digital infrastructure is in place so that it becomes a level playing field in respect to which town and which village you reside. The third and most important thing if you ask me, India is a country which is full of diversity. Everything in India changes every 150 kilometers. The language, the dialect, the eating habits, the way you think, the, the cultures, etc., etc. India has 22 official languages, 300 unofficial languages. The language you speak at home versus the language I speak at home while we work around school are as different from each other as are possibly German and French. So this diversity of India needs to be respected. We all, as governments and as private entities as well, we all need to ensure that innovators, irrespective of what background they come from, from a rural area, it could be a woman or a man, it could be a youngster or an old guy, irrespective of who you are, what religion you belong to, or what social class you belong to, you need to be given opportunities that are equal and inclusive. With this three I mantra, I sincerely believe India can propel itself into the first league, first world. So, in the crowd here, we have a lot of well meaning citizens, very excited young people from rural India, what can they do in their individual capacity to contribute to the growth and, and get India to achieve its desired position globally? I think all of us Indians, you know, have been taught from a very early stage. Now, when I was growing up as a young man uh, in the 80s and 90s, I used to see around me that, you know, while we have this amazing, amazing uh, problem-solving ability, we are always taught from a very early stage not to take much risk. We are told that you can be a job seeker, not a job creator. Entrepreneurship is something that has not been, uh, you know, promoted as a culture among Indian society. From a very early stage, Indian parents tell you, become a doctor or an engineer, get a job, settle in life, get married, have children, buy a house, buy a car, etc., etc. Not a single Indian parent would actually tell you, Go out into the world, chase your dreams, follow your dreams, and be ambitious and actually take a risk. Fortunately, debt in India has looked down upon, frowned upon. So this fundamental shift in attitudes that we ought to be risk taking, we ought to think big, we ought to think global, and we we are solving the problem. We 
remember that you are solving one fifth of humanity's problem. So therefore, I think our ambition, our vision needs to expand a bit. Our risk taking appetite needs to expand a bit more. And culturally and sociologically, Indians need to start thinking big and start experimenting. Remember, after all, it's one life with a very limited lifespan, with a very limited uh, capacity. So therefore, we need to risk a bit more is what I would say. And youngsters here, especially, I think my time in Desh's time when we were growing up, I think there wasn't much appetite uh, of capital. In today's India, in today's world, capital is not a, not a challenge anymore. You can raise capital if you have the right kind of idea, if you have the right kind of product, the markets are there to lap it up. So therefore, I think taking a bit more risk, thinking big, thinking global, not just thinking India, I think that's the way forward from an Indian youngster's perspective, if you ask me. Finding ways to do it. You know, I was in Basra yesterday and met these 10,000 students uh, for the cream of the crop. And, and this new initiative that Raju and Megan Raman have to really inject this entrepreneurial spirit in them is something that we really need to keep pushing at. Because when you ask them what job, what do you want in the future? They all say government jobs. And, and so I think, I think we have to make them a lot more ambitious, a lot more entrepreneurial to move the country forward. Now, you know, we talked about how democracy is a good thing. But it has its own limitations. In fact, it's worse in US than in India because in US, congressmen have to get elected every two years. So as soon as they get elected, the election starts again. So, so what are the secrets to make sure that in democracy, the bureaucracy and the political engine can be productive? Well, I wish there was a short answer. Um, the one thing I would say is, you know, if, a, if, a, if a leader, if the head of the state, in the case of Telangana, our honorable chief minister, he's a man of great vision. He is a man who is also rooted in reality and grassroots. If the leader has the political will, I think that bureaucracy and every other system that is supposed to work with the government will fall in place. And a great example, like I said, is the execution of one of the largest projects in the world. The largest lift irrigation project in the world being completed in four years in a democracy like India. With all the challenges that we have, it's a classic example of how things can be done. But having said that, I think Besides the political resolve, the political will, what matters also, uh, sincerely, I am saying this with the most sincerity, I think politicians should stop worrying about winning their next election all the time. If we decide that it's okay to lose an election, if we decide that it's okay to actually sit out, maybe next five years, then we can get a lot of stuff done, honestly. Otherwise, you know, you're always sucking up, you're always trying to win the next election, you're always trying to do what is more popular than what is right. So therefore, I think that fine balance that is missing is something that India needs to find. Unfortunately, it's easier said than done, but I think uh, there will come a time when development will take center stage and not halals and hijabs and other nonsense. And then I think India will actually move forward in the right direction, the right kind of with the right kind of goals. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, we have, if any of you have your questions that you want to ask him, please come forward. And, and maybe we can ask them one or two questions. So, so please stand up and come here to the front so that we can bring a mic to you because we really have a lot of time. So, KDR, one of the things that, how can we make more of that happen? Great presentation. In fact, Telangana, not only we have funny, but in fact, uh, my entire department of industry and commerce and IT, information technology, has almost uh, 15 different uh, very bright uh, young people from uh, data who are working in various, various very, very senior positions. In fact, uh, one of the gentlemen is working with us for the last eight years who is heading now our director as director of electronics and semiconductors is currently in the US. So what we've done in Telangana consciously is we've called them for the best of the talent that there is in the private sector. We have invited them to be a part of the government, use this lateral entry as an opportunity to ensure that 
we get the best expertise. And I think you rightly pointed out, bureaucracy in India is more of an administrative capability. And bureaucrats in India are usually to sit in their ivory towers and with all the entrepreneurs coming to them and you know, literally pleading with them, Sir, you can do it. Unfortunately, unless we change that mindset a bit by pushing them more aggressively, by ensuring that they also get exposure to the private sector. In fact, if you ask me, I would send most of my bureaucrats into the private sector for a couple of years so that they understand you know, what the other side of the uh, uh, table looks like. So therefore, I think a mix of both, sending our bureau bureaucrats and bureaucracy into the private sector for a bit and also getting the private sector into the government sector uh, uh, to co-op them, I think is, a, is the right model. Way forward, I would imagine uh, you know, more and more positive uh, outcomes with measurable you know, uh, goals, you know, like how you do your uh, uh, performance appraisal. Now that sort of a system also needs to be brought into government. And I think a combination of all this would really good. Yeah. That would be fantastic. So, any questions? Yeah. Yes. This is a fast-growing scene as well in Hyderabad. My name is Sandhya Prakash. Dear Prakash. Sandhya. Thank you, Sandhya. Great question. See, honestly, we have not done enough justice. I will not uh, uh, give you a fake answer. We have not done enough so far. Uh, there is still a lot to do. But I only urge one thing of uh, women leaders and women representatives. See, today in Telangana, we have 50% of women representatives in both Gram Panchayatis, Municipalities, and Zilla Parishads. We have 32 Zilla Parishads, 142 Municipalities and urban local bodies, 12,769 Gram Panchayatis. We have 50% women leaders there. But in the legislature and the parliament, legislature, we have 190. Uh, you know, MLA seats 120 rather, out of which we only have six women legislators. And in parliament again, out of 543, I'm not sure how many women parliamentarians are there. The only way we can change this is of course continuing to push and maybe bringing in legislation. The 33% reservation bill that was talked about. Because you know, affirmative action, no matter wherever in the world, be it in the US or be it in a developing country like India, the one way Things can happen is by way of legislation. My party, led by our honorable CM, has always wanted the 33% uh, reservation bill to be taken. So hopefully, the day is not far, hopefully, like I said, because unfortunately, we don't run the government of India now. So whatever goes within our purview, we brought 50% reservation there. But I hope and pray the government of India also will wake up bringing this legislation. In the meantime, in the meantime, I promise you that next election, uh, we'll start looking at more representation of women. But you know, these happen. These women are leaders also. will have to come from within the ranks. You cannot be staying away from politics for four and a half years and coming to us in the last six months and saying, listen, I need a seat because I've done some good work elsewhere. Not in your political party, maybe, but elsewhere. So I think a lot of pressure also has to come from within the ranks. And uh, that sort of pushing the envelope has to come from within, not from outside. That's what I would want. Thank you, sir. Islamabad and you don't want to, you want to resist the temptation of moving to Hyderabad or Bangalore, is it? Yeah, I want, to, I want to know what is it that the uh, state can do to retake talent in Telangana, in Hyderabad, Islamabad, wherever. It's progressive to, to, to do anything coercive to stop people from migrating. No country has succeeded to it. Now, China has tried very successfully to contain people from urbanization because they realize that urbanization is a real problem, suburbanization a real problem. Coercion, coercion does not work sharply. What we have to do as, uh, as governments is create better livelihood opportunities, better education opportunities, better health care opportunities. These are the three fundamental things why people migrate. Better livelihood is why most of the students go to the US and UK and elsewhere. Because they believe a United States degree, including myself, I've been to the US and I've gone to school there. Why do we migrate? Why do we actually go abroad? Because we believe that the degree that is conferred on those by those universities actually holds a better value. So unless we compete with them and create better institutions, we cannot contain them. Likewise, why does somebody from a small village move to Nizamabad? Why does somebody from Nizamabad move to Hyderabad? And why does somebody from Hyderabad move to US? So this is a process, this is a journey. What we have to realize is human beings by nature are in constant pursuit of excellence are in constant pursuit of social empowerment and economic empowerment. You can't find fault with the human nature. But at the same time, 
those such as yourself or Manish who said it's not just the pursuit of economic empowerment but pursuit of purpose, pursuit of happiness. You can skateboard wherever you want, provide it, provide it. As a government, I can give you better education opportunities, healthcare opportunities and livelihood opportunities. So this is a continuous endeavor and I don't think any government has cracked it across the world, not in India. So we, it's, a, it's a continuous process and, and I would sincerely think it's regressive to actually say, to put an embargo and say you can't do it. That's, that's, not, uh, that's not the right way to handle this, what I was doing. Cheers. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Shabir. Hi, sir. Uh, I'm Srinivas and I'm the end of the report. Srinivas, great question. So we have a very unique challenge in Asia and uh, state. In fact, a lot of my customers from Rizama, they migrate to the Gulf, to the, to the at least two countries in search of that. Whereas Nizamabad fields, or if you go to Kamarandi fields, or even my district, which is very close, uh, in Sirsila, you have workers coming from other states in India to work here. It's a very unique challenge here, especially in the vocational kind of process, you know, the plumbing, the electrician, the, the fitters, the carpenters, the gentlemen who are involved, or the, the workers who are involved in the construction industry. They come from every looking corner in India. Whereas the Telangana youngsters are to the Gulf. It's a very interesting problem, very interesting uh, uh, conundrum if you ask me. The only way I see this changing, in fact as I was walking out of uh, the helipad, I saw a beautiful new building being, new building being built right next to the collectorate. So I asked my honorable minister, Rashad Redigar, I said, what is this building? He said, it is the National Academy of Construction Building. NAC building. And NAC building that is being built in Islamabad will ensure that besides tasks like the one you just mentioned, all of these vocational courses are given due importance, are going to you know, prepare a skilled workforce which will help us you know, possibly take opportunities in these spaces that I just mentioned. But that's just not enough. There's the polytechnics, there's the ITIs. Unfortunately, we have not focused enough on them, but we are getting to that stage where we will probably start looking at more and more internships, apprenticeships, practice school kind of an option where we can have these children working, doing their diploma courses, work in the industry for about six months, gain practical exposure, so therefore become more readily employable by the time they graduate. A combination of all these, I think, will encourage our local youngsters to get better employment opportunities. Yeah, so we are actually looking forward to the time Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, uh, all the four questions that we just discussed. Anna. 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 Anna, great question. You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure, I'm, I'm going to go on a limb and take a guess, that both Raju and Desh went to a government school. Am I right? Or did you go to a private school, right? You did. So these two gentlemen who made it big in their life and who are now giving back to their cities, Nizamabad and Mumbai, have both, both gone to a uh, public school, not a private school. So, you know, it doesn't, doesn't really matter whether you go to a public school or a government school or a private school, as long as you know you have the ability to imbibe, learn and be ambitious in terms of your world, world view and world outcome. Because I know a number of leaders, including our chief minister, who has actually gone to a public school and has become what he has become as a first generation politician. So no matter what you want with life, be it a top notch, either in public life or politics, bureaucrat or entrepreneur, I think what matters is how well you buy those skills and not otherwise, and where you buy them. So I hope I answered your question partially. Cheers. And Hena, also I'd like to add that the fact out of box thinking is very natural for people when they come from a different place. So what we need to do is to inject all of that training into education systems so that people can think out of box, living exactly in the box. They don't have to go far away to learn all this. But having a conscious way of exposing people to different experiences is what makes them creative. And so, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, I think uh, patient hearing throughout the question.
career has been in making that happen. So, you know, finding, a, you know, that kind of a pattern that, you know, what women's credit behavior is very different from male and you've been in power, Nabad for so many years, for so many decades. Hello. And so, uh, you know, we've seen how women, when they are given credit from, a, from an institutional perspective or from a consumption perspective, their behavior has changed. So, why don't you share, share with us these aspects of, you know, when we are designing for credit for Bharat, right? In, do we account for the women as, as the, you know, as the person to whom we have given credit or the men? How do we design that? <laughs> I think uh, most uh, assets or the land is owned by men who is in the neighborhood men. That's why although programs are designed for women or uh, the credit is given in the name of the woman, the lender insists on the man, the husband or the father to be a co-borrower in this kind of arrangements. And the reverse is not true actually. So if a man goes to lay to borrow, the bank or the lender will not insist on the spouse to be a co-signatory. Now these are uh, aspects I think we have to work to resolve. So microfinance to an extent has attempted to do that, still I think a long way to go. And uh, with two decades of this program being on the ground, there is enough evidence to establish uh, the difference in credit behavior. But taking those into product structuring and product pricing hasn't really happened. So I think the lending institutions have found women as good clients. They've been repaying well, but the risk pricing that has gone into these products has not been reworked out, taking into account their good credit behavior. So that I think in my view will come only by time. No lending institution is going to voluntarily do this. And therefore, irrespective of what we may feel about a liberalized credit regime, minimum regulation, it is essential that these have to be brought in by direction initially. And only then it will happen. Because we find that microfinance institutions today have become convenient intermediaries to banks. So if a bank can directly lend, it still prefers not to do it and directs people to borrow from an institution, which adds 5 to 10 percent to the cost of borrowing, which is basically the intermediary's cost of operation and his profits. And these need to be disintermediated and these can bring down lending costs significantly. It's not going to happen on its own, it needs to be done through intervention by the state, in my view. No, so the reason why I'm bringing this male, male and female credit behaviors is, one of the fascinating things I'm discovering right now is, with agritech penetration happening, we are also seeing a significant behavioral changes in, 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 in which reflects in the gender. Like for instance, you know, coming to, to what Sriram is working on, there is now studies that talk about how mechanization has reduced women's participation in a lot of agricultural included activities, right? And there is now clear correlation that is showing up. So which brings what I want to bring into Shira, that when we are designing from agricultural mechanization, right? In what ways can we can we acknowledge the fact that it is actually the women who are often doing a lot of the implements work, right? And, and I'm sure you have you have a, a team of economists and people who are also studying this thing. So in what ways are you looking at it from a design perspective, keeping in mind that you know it is actually women who are doing much more agricultural labor work than men? Yeah, I think uh, the, the India has changed. Say maybe like 30 years ago, women were not driving two wheelers. So Activa was designed for women and it's a big thing, right? So similarly, uh, if uh, there are small implements, uh, there is a startup in India. Uh, they have been designing a small lander. Actually, they showed me a video like a woman is driving that lander and she is uh, doing the cultivation in the rice uh, farm. Uh, I think the ease of use and the uh, we think like 
probably the women would operate these equipments in a more sensible manner than men. So, I think, uh, <laughs> so probably, uh, so to scale up these equipments. But hurting themselves, I mean, that's what you told the male who happened, who went to the shoes. <laughs> so, probably that would encourage, uh, same, same, we are not like uh, women, uh, they have their talent. They kind of use it in a better manner and they also know how to generate more income from the machine. So apart from using it gently, uh, they can also figure out uh, uh, how to utilize it in a better way and uh, make it better. And apart from that, the major uh, challenge is, uh, it's not the equipment alone, it's how do we use the equipment matters. So, when we want to do a spraying in a farm, usually the regular practice is just they just uh, this is, it has the tractor has to be run at certain speed, the implement has to be run at certain speed, like maybe at 3 km per hour, 4 km per hour. And uh, so probably women can operate it in a better way, they can do it slowly rather than be going fast. <laughs> which is which is an interesting point to bring Rajesh here because Rajesh is, is doing a very interesting work in mapping the entire demand curve of how farmers' behaviors are actually reflecting on the ground based on their online usage. Right? So, uh, you know, this question might sound really cheesy, but I'll still put it up. What, what do, you know, Indian men and Indian women, you know, who are users of Rishi Rishi Fire, what do they want? What are their behavior insights that you are and, and seeing, seeing from analytics? from your tissue by platform, that is, that surprised me. So, uh, see, if you see the way the platform is designed again, if you see Indian farmers, they are very diverse in terms of their economic background, in terms of their sources of income, primary sources of income, uh, cropping pattern, etc. entire life. So, we, you know, when we thought about it, like, so what kind of problem these guys face and how can we map the problems first? And then we realize that since there is so much of diversity among these farmers, right, and at different stages they face different types of problems, the problems are very fragmented, right, and uh, that's why we decided to create, and, and if you see like how these problems are getting solved today, right, so that, so agriculture has always been a community activity, right, most often we see that community is limited by a physical boundary, which generally is a village. That's where we thought, let's build a community where we break that geographical barrier and let farmers connect with everyone, right? Not just farmers, but also other important stakeholders of the ecosystem and let them explore opportunities at every stage of their life cycle. So why they do so? And that's how the platform is designed. So, you know, they can have discussions. You will see farmers asking questions about crop disease, discussing about their agribusiness, uh, you know, uh, issues like dairy, poultry, whatever they are involved with. Machinery asks, input asks, which variety to grow, right? So, and, and you know, we have created that interesting data layer to understand insights from all these discussions that are happening, and that's the biggest source of data. So, what farmers are taking more interest in, right? And with time, we have started seeing some trend around changing that behavior. Like what is also last year, let's say, during particular cropping season, the kind of discussions that were happening. Help the patterns of all businesses change this year in this season, right? Are people talking more about some kind of machinery? Are they talking about some other kind of crop protection solution? And that's what we judge, right? And that gives us much deeper insights of what behavior shift is happening. In the, even in terms of cropping pattern, right? We have realized in certain areas, in certain geographies, there is always, you know, a hustle bustle between two crops, like which one to grow and farmers decide at the very end date. Right? If, if it uh, is raining more, probably they will go with, uh, uh, you know, black ground or if it rained less, probably they will go with mustard and that's how the decisions are made. So as a platform, we try to figure out can we understand from their regular chit chat what decisions are they going to make, right? And basis that, can we create that demand graph? What if they are going to grow mustard, probably their entire need is going to be different, right, in the entire system. And that's where we connect with you know various agri companies, uh, manufacturers, input uh, folks to kind of meet the needs. So we are almost we've done two rounds, and we would love to open this up for the audience there who may want to ask any specific questions here. Uh, you know, I, I'm told that.
there are a few other few other people from Architect who are also coming here. Uh, Ram Chivi and, and uh, Sanjay Vidyarthi also. So this is a good, if you would love to you know, ask any questions to the panel, feel free. Yes, please. Yes, Sanjay. Uh, hi. My question is to uh, Emmanuel. Uh, so this is, uh, as you mentioned, there's a lot of push from the government and everyone else into FPOs, FPCs, cooperatives, right? There's subsidies, there's uh, education and so on. Why is this not happening with companies and solo entrepreneurs, right? Why, I mean, uh, we've always known that uh, capitalism works best. Why not uh, help uh, companies and solo entrepreneurs in a similar way and agree with subsidies and uh, support? So his question is, uh, today, we, we talk a lot about subsidies and supporting entrepreneurs for SPOs and all that. So why not help companies, I think companies with subsidies and support rather than only supporting SPOs? This is his question. Uh, yeah, I think uh, if we see agri companies and their profitability, they are already doing business with Indian farmers. And there are hidden subsidies in their business also, in terms of fertilizer and other things. Government already provides incentives to them. Now, the FPO program itself, if you see, the amount that is budgeted is 6,000 crore for 10,000 FPOs, which I think in terms of efficiency is a very, very nominal amount. And actually, in adding good to build robust institutions. Now what is happening again if you see, interestingly, Reliance Foundation, Walmart, all these guys are indirectly getting into the FPO space, promoting their own FPOs, which are going to be supply chains to their companies. And therefore they are benefiting, even ITC is talking about promoting 7,000 FPOs. So in fact, if you see a little closer, all these corporates are trying to plug into this program and try to build their own supply chains and therefore uh, benefit from this program. E effectively, the kind of money that is there in this program is too tiny to interest any corporate. It's too insignificant to be of any interest to any corporate. And the responsibilities that come along with it are pretty massive. So really, they are benefiting from it without no, but I think this underlying premise of the question, if I get it right, this is also a very interesting question for this. It says, it says like, should, why not let market solve these problems and why bring government? Okay, so the key problem is of aggregation. No corporate, the fertilizer company or the seed company or the owners of the world are able to directly deal with farmers. So they need an intermediary institution to negotiate with a large number of farmers. And these FPOs seem to be that collective structure whereby they can get as close to farmers as possible. And that is how it's going to be. Any, any more questions? So first part is... Deliberately put you on the spot here. Huh? Deliberately put you on the spot. I know, I know. Uh, <laughs> so first part is, I think, going back to the two questions that were asked, I think there is a fundamental first principles question, right? which is how do we treat a farmer? Are we treating a farmer as a free business agent? Like any person in the market, a farmer should be treated as a person who can transact with companies, with others, or, or are we treating them as a national asset, which is they're working on public good, on a business that is inherently unsustainable for small farmers, but they have to do what they have to do because we have to eat. Because we have to glamorize them as another. The question is, question of how are we treating this person? And that's a question. The related question is how many farmers does India need? You said to me yesterday that 41% of our population is farmers. We need 41% of people to be farmers because in developed economies it's 6%. Right? I think unless we answer that question, we will keep looking at some of these symptoms and asking ourselves whether it will work, number one. The second part I want to add is that philanthropy has done a lot of rubbish. There are places where philanthropy has no role to play. Also, subsidies have no role to play, where I think it skews the market. I mean, we should understand basically that philanthropy addresses market failure or government failure. Right? 
when government can't deliver or market can't deliver, it's where philanthropy has to come. Drip irrigation is a classic example where market could have played and solved the problem. Right? Philanthropy should not have played a role there. Today, honestly, subsidies in fertilizers should not be given. There was a period of time, a window of time, where subsidies in fertilizers is necessary to build a habit. Now it's built to become a habit and become an addiction. We are still subsidizing fertilizers, which is causing many problems for the state. It is the largest subsidy scheme in the country. So hence, it's necessary to remember where subsidies are relevant. It's where market failure or state failure happens. Farmer producer organizations are in an initial stage. Some subsidy in the beginning to for them to stabilize makes sense. But they have to be time bound, limited, incentive based. If you don't do that, it's irresponsible money going to different people. And you have to know when is that time, new by date, by which it ends. So why do companies like it? It makes them lazy. It's free money. I mean, it's like skilling ecosystem. Right? So I think there are mistakes there. And I think philanthropy should recognize where it should stop doing things. And state should recognize where it should have meddled with where the market are more efficient. So I'll just uh, add uh, to the context of your question that over a period, the Indian farmer has become five times more indebted while his income has just doubled. And this is a statistic that is showing. But in the startup ecosystem, there's a kind of uh, hype now that ag fintechs are going to be the future and 80% of Indian farmers are startup credit. You know, contradictory statements uh, floating around. And I think uh, the reality is we still need to provide efficient, low-cost, timely credit to Indian farmers. And that is a problem that has not been solved. In my view, the banking system has to be the key driver of this. Actex have to provide the technology to deliver it. On their own, neither the banks nor Actex are going to solve this problem. And we cannot afford to further burden on an argument that we are substituting informal credit. I think that's a specious argument that is being sold to try and say that a farmer is indifferent to interest costs. It's only availability that is the key factor. These are all uh, myths, unsubstantiated. I think uh, driven by Anja Capital, which needs to be, I think, seriously addressed. On the farmer indebtedness, we can get formal credit from the civil and other data. What is missing from there is the informal credit and the primary credit cooperative society borrowings, which is again I think uh, not too large, can be captured by duplication, and we can easily do that data. Any good rural branch manager who is operating on the ground has a very good sense of the indebtedness of his farmers. So it's if you are grounded on the ground, we have very clear data on both credit behavior and indebtedness of farmers. These are all macro type that is clear. No, and, and that is why probably we need more incubators also, right? I mean, I want to also plug in the you know, Kakitya sandbox in this aspect there, where we need these kind of lab spaces where we can bring down a lot of these costs and make it at an affordable rate that is helpful. So, so, so yes, and that is, you know, we have two minutes more. Any last questions? Yes, please. Are you saying in what ways can women incorporate some of these and become work in the agriculture? No, I'm just saying like you, you spoke about um, how men and women uh, get different sorts of access to credit and one of the problems. So I'm just wondering, um, do you see like women also working in this field and working towards more solutions and how do you plan to work with women on this issue uh, as you look at women's issues? So this, you got the question. So this, her question is how, you know, we see that the difference in behaviors and how women approach credit and their technologies and all. So in what ways can we make sure that we, we work more with women farmers and address some of their challenges in the term? Rajesh, you want to take a shot? So, uh, you know, so again, uh, awareness has a huge role to play here. How women farmers are making it big. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, such, you know, uh, instances where women are actually, so there is, there is a famous woman uh, called Kisan Chaji based out of Bihar, you might have heard about her. Uh, a few years ago she was awarded Tanushree. 
So if you hear her story and we have you know tried to bring her on board or crucify and do multiple such stories with her, how she actually you know has created that kind of a name in a profession in that area at least in Bihar I can say which is male domin dominated, right? So and it's a social stigma if a woman goes out in the farms doing Lego work herself, that's a social stigma associated with that. But I think these kind of stories again social security when women feel great and women are appreciated enough when they do uh, such things. While we also can talk about a lot of benefits given to farmers in general, I think benefits if we are since we are already giving benefits, benefits associated specifically to women can you know again change the narrative. Yes, we have one more question. Yes. Thank you for being candid. And also, you just rightly mentioned about we see high in terms of agri food, right? Uh, I just want to add another more in terms of topic. Uh, one is, what, in your opinion, what exactly is on ground Bharat market potential like for agri food? For what? Agri next. Barrel potential for agri-tech because uh, I am also in the busy space. Everyone comes to me and says that uh, we are building for Barrel and they say yeah, the market potential is infinite. But in your opinion, what do you think is the exact potential in terms of problem? <laughs> it's, it's a very uh, difficult number to fix on. There have been various reports stating this. What I could say is, agriculture is changing, people are changing, you know. So, drudgery in agriculture is something that has to be addressed. Resource constraints have to be addressed. Ch uh, climate change has to be addressed. So, all these require appropriate solutions on the ground. Many of those solutions are there on the shelf. And getting them to the farmers is the issue. So the whole key to a successful agri-tech is a farmer-centric solution, that's all. That is which is the missing piece. You know, all these solutions which people show up are there without having the execution capability. Unless we have the ability to take these two farmers at scale, at an affordable cost, they're not going to work. So what most architects say is you pay a price, then you see the benefits. We'll have to reverse that and say you first reap the benefits, share, share the profits with us. So that will have to be, but we are seeing a lot of optimism and it's going to be driven by promoters who are from a set. That's it. Sanjay, uh, would you like to come and share your thing with us? I think this topic is excellent. Transforming agri value chains in India. My uh, suggestion to all of you is that this is a massive case study. Uh, and all of you guys which have been talking about. Uh, Amun is a fantastic example of whatever you talk about in agri value chains. They've already done it. Talk about FPO, they are the largest FPO in India, 3.6 million farmers. 61,000 crore is the FPO. Of Amun, right? It's, it's an amazing story. Nestle is 12,000 people. These are the guys who really created the first value chain as far as dairy farming is concerned, and it's the same thing. Somebody talked about women empowerment or women engagement. They were the first ones to really bring women into really uh, value chains, uh, dairy value chains. Why are we not? I have a question. It's not even Amul as a success story. And I think, you know, that, that, that's also another aspect of where we are in the ecosystem. So, I mean, I'll let others who are much more honored uh, there, but yes. Thank you for that question. I am one of the early graduates of Irma, worked with NADB, seen our life close quarters. Uh, all of these programs are designed to create more amuls. But there are several reasons why amul work. The commodity, the geography, the context, the timing. And uh, therefore, it is difficult and hard to replicate. 
but that could be the standard which all of us want to learn. Thank you. Yes, so with that, uh, we are coming to an end of this panel. Uh, our intent is to, to really look at the different dimensions of you know, agriculture and value chain and look at different facets that are often not talked about together. So for that matter, I am very glad that all of you could travel here. We, we wanted to have few more people but who couldn't turn at the last moment. But nevertheless, uh, extremely delighted with all the share, share our thoughts and spend our time with all of you. Thank you so much. Right, and uh, on behalf of the audience, I love the honesty with which everybody answered all the questions. Everybody called a spade a spade. There was no sugar coating. There was no hyperbole. So in principle, we did follow the first principle to the D. Thank you so much. You were fantastic. <laughs> right. So before you leave the stage, we just can't leave you without people on stage today. And the only thing common amongst all of them is the humility that brings to the table. So, if you really want to be successful, the foundation stone has to be the humility. And all of them have been there, done that. And they're so unassuming. Thank you so much for teaching all of us to do that. Go ahead. Request uh, Mr. Sri Shail coming. Mr. Rajesh. Mr. Rajesh, I thought uh, sandwich between two people I thought uh, felt like a little Bombay local for you, but then uh, once you got the mic, you created your own space there with that invitation. Thank you so much. Uh, requesting Ravish to share our speaker, to translate our speaker from Bangalore. Somebody who said there are spaces where social entrepreneurship should not exist, there are spaces where uh, Extending credit should not exist. Help them create models and people will succeed. I think that's, that's how everything works. And thank you so much for sharing the insight on the, the fertilizer subsidy. Honestly, let's let's go back to the drawing board and decide why is it there still and what's the purpose it's achieving. Thank you so much. And uh, requesting the chair for this panel. Oh, yes, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Right. To make it for uh, the servant chin Thank you so much uh, and thank you Venki for holding this entire panel together. It looked long when we started but then it looked short towards the end of it and I think that's the magic all of you did on stage. Thank you so much, lovely having you. Pleasure, pleasure. Thank you. The achievement that is to be announced today on this stage and the brilliant opportunity that comes along with it and to announce that I would request uh, Mr. Rajanini, sir, to please come up on stage along with uh, Abhiryon Ramesh Bhimani to talk to us about the Turbulic Initiative that's going to be announced on this very stage. So development dialogue also spills into some action. Stage is all yours. So, uh, just to uh, try and keep this short. So, India produces about 82% of the world's turbulence. 80%. And Nizamabad in the 50 mile radius produces roughly about 20% of that. And about 40% of India's turmeric is traded through Nizamabad. So this in many ways we believe can be and should be the turmeric capital of the world. We leverage it right. Now the reality is the farmer income in turmeric has been going down. Frankly, it has been a political issue also for the last few years. So we want to tread this carefully. Our approach to any of these rural livelihood problems is all about unleashing the spirit of entrepreneurship. So we had a fantastic gift by one of the world's best known entrepreneurs and philanthropists, Karwal Rekhi, as some of you know. We, uh, so we created something called Press, Karwal Rekhi Rural Entrepreneurship and Startup Center. Uh, he gave us 20 crores. Uh, so press is starting up in Nizamabad, uh, right at the day. Thank you, we are very excited about it, of course. And uh, so one of the initiatives under that that we wanted to in particular sort of take more, uh, you know, uh, put more effort into is uh, the turmeric initiative. Essentially, for any entrepreneurs anywhere in the world 
that are interested in addressing the problems of our opportunities of rural livelihoods. We want Nizamabad to be the number one choice for them. That's our goal. But any, any entrepreneur or any innovator in the world, you could be from America, you could be from Ukraine or wherever, of course, any other part of India and the local ones in Nizamabad, we want to be a number one choice. So underneath that, this turmeric initiative is something we thought is very important. Any of the innovators that have ideas, products, either in market linkages or processing turmeric or uh, I mean, uh, or actually in production of turmeric, uh, there are a lot of innovations that can be introduced to improve the productivity of the farmers, uh, whether equipment or automation, any, any ideas. And that's really up to the entrepreneurs, right? Uh, and we want to be the number one choice clearly for the turmeric uh, given the local ecosystem. So that's really uh, kind of the essence of what we wanted to announce. And Ravish Bhivani, he lives right here in Nizamabad. Their company, Gajanan Industries, is one of the largest uh, food exporters out of Nizamabad, paddy exporters. Uh, in fact, they export to US and to China. I mean, I live in US, I didn't realize when I buy Lakshmi brand of uh, House of Spices, right? It's actually coming from Gajana. It's one of the more popular brands that many of you who live in the US might be familiar with that. So, Ravish comes from the Nagari family and is also the first founding uh, president of Thai Nizamabad. And I can't think of a better person than Ravish to be the point person for the turmeric initiative. So, I'll leave it there. If Ravish, you can add any questions, any other comments. Thank you. To summarize what we are looking at two major interventions. One is at the farm level. How do we increase the uh, farmer's income who are in proper production? And anyone who is actually interested in processing turmeric because uh, turmeric trading in Nizamabad is close to about 2,500 crores per annum. But less than 1% of the turmeric is getting processed in Nizamabad. So how do we so how do we increase that? So I would be the point of contact and my email address. Check, check, check. Talk soon. Move to the next slide. Okay. Action. So my, I can be reached on double nine eight nine four seven six triple one. That's my mobile number. And I can be mailed on Ravish Mani dot ks at dfmail.org. I repeat Ravish Mani R A V I S H D H I M A N I dot ks at the rate dfmail.org. You'll see the real world, the SRI systemic rice initiative work and also the PCI better cotton initiative. We are working with over 1 lakh farmers and of course the farm ponds and variety of other very interesting uh, uh, stalls out there. Agastya and Nirman and you know, several others. Uh, so and you, how can I forget? NEWS, Zamba, the Environment and Wildlife Society for those who are interested in wildlife, preserving nature. It's extraordinary. It was stunning the first time I went and saw that. And I actually see uh, Chandrasekhar Reddy, who is uh, Chairman of the Forest Department. Uh, big shout out to Shekhar. Thank you, Shekhar, for joining us. And Harsh Bhargava, who is part of the uh, Dakin uh, Birds, or uh, what's that, the organization that is uh, you know, focused on wildlife preservation and all of that. So there's a lot of uh, people you know, who have a keen interest in helping us with this uh, initiative around uh, you know, the wildlife preservation. But in general, take your time to go visit the booths and uh, you know, on turmeric, hopefully we'll have some things to report in coming DDs. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, And I think uh, the highlight before lunch is to talk to one of those change makers. Uh, if you remember, when it was about light of the lamp, we announced that it's going to be led by the change makers. And the first change maker we're going to be talking to, or in fact, who's going to be sharing her story, under this beautiful section, so-called uh, dreams have no boundaries. And I think dreams have no boundaries because the change makers are people who did not stop at dreaming. They went ahead and implemented all those changes that they wanted to see come alive. And Shravya is something. Every time I talk to her, the question invariably is, what are you working on? And most of the times the answers change, 
but not without the impact that she intended. The impact is always there, she creates and then move on to new dreams. So Shravya is an entrepreneur, a passionate one, and she's passionate about organizations and innovation that strive to make a meaningful impact for the community. Try having a conversation with her, the word community will pop up at a frequency once at least two and a half minutes. She's one of the founders of Farm Chakra, an agri company building a portfolio of eco-friendly farms. She has over 13 years of leadership experience in diverse sectors such as education, rural transformation, oil and gas. She's part of the founding team of Kakatiya Sandbox and co-founded Thai Nizamabad chapter. Shravya graduated from Bits Pilani, Rajasthan. So please put your hands together as a final stage, Shravya Ray. Can you raise your hands, please? A good, yeah, a good number of you, right? Unlike most people, for my husband Ajit and me, the weather app is the app that we use the most. You know, wonder why we use the weather app the most? Because we are building a farming company. And what is a Bitspilani electronics graduate and an IIT chemical engineer doing building a farming company? Let me uh, walk you through our journey in the last decade to tell you how we ended up here. Nizamabad is my hometown and I spent my entire childhood here. I was waiting to grow wings to fly away. I was fortunate to go to a good college, land a very good job. I worked in three continents in six, uh, six years and I enjoyed my job. Then suddenly at the age of 28, I had an existential crisis. That's when Ajit, my husband, prodded me to think about going back to my roots. Probably it would help us, you know, put some meaning back into my life and get us closer to finding our purpose. So there, you know, the was left our corporate careers, took a huge leap of faith and we moved to Nizamabad in 2014. In the last decade, we spent a good part of the last decade here and we uh, wore multiple hats. We started our work with my mother's affordable private school, built it, scaled it and transformed it to be one of the best emerging uh, affordable schools in South India. And then uh, with Ravish, whom you just saw on the stage, we co-founded uh, Time Samabar. And for those of you who were in Sankar last evening, you would have seen the vibrant community we created right here in Samabar. The thing with creating value is it's very exciting and it's intense, it's uh, very humbling and it's very addictive. You can't stop doing that once you get used to doing it in a certain way. And when you cross paths with entrepreneurs, innovators, thinkers like Raj, Mutesh, Pani, and so many people we've met in the Zambad during their visit to the Kakutia Sandbox, it has gotten us to think about how can we pole vault, how can we dream bigger, how can we make a larger impact and a larger difference. And we, that was very helpful when we started thinking about what to do next. We were sitting on this huge immersive experience of having lived in rural, semi-urban rural India, interacting with agri-community. We live amidst paddy fields and uh, talking to different people in the agri-community and listening to their challenges, it piqued our interest in the space. And we wanted to do something to solve uh, the challenges and solve some of the challenges and some problems in agriculture. We strongly believe that to solve a problem, we have to experience it first. So that's when three and a half years ago, we started farming ourselves. So in our current model, we lease land from large farmland owners who are not interested in farm anymore. We employ small and marginal farmers on a monthly salary income and we grow residue tree produce. So we take all the risks that, the short term risks that sustainable practices uh, have. Uh, but we are, you know, our focus is to build both social and commercial value. We want to increase the profitability of the land, but also while keeping in mind the sustainability. Now, finding resources to do pilots like this in rural areas is not easy. Starting up is hard, and starting up, especially the initial stages in rural areas, it's it's even harder because it's super unorganized. It's 
messy, it's chaotic, there's a trust deficit. And all of this can derail your focus. We were very fortunate to have this ecosystem here. Korode, uh, an entrepreneur, probably around here, he is connected to the ecosystem. He helped us find simple resources like a clear link, a clear land that can be leased, reliable, trustworthy farm supervisors who can work with us on our farms, electricians on demand who can prepare the pumps. So these are very basic things, but they can completely derail your project. We were able to do our pilots at the rate that we did only because of an ecosystem like the sandbox. For entrepreneurs like us who are building uh, for Bharat and in Bharat, we need these ecosystems to sort of you know help us find our footing. And uh, the engineers that we are, we thought you know we'll throw some good tech, build some good systems, uh, and good man use good management practices to streamline things. It's been three and a half years and we're still uncovering more and more problems as we continue on this journey of uh, agriculture. There is no doubt that tech has to be at the center of it. But, like the speakers here said, we need several other elements to work in tandem. Community transformation, education and skilling to you know, learn to use equipment, uh, rural development. Without these, the solution is not going to be complete. And the journey that we have had in the last decade, wearing all those hats, I feel has built, helped us build an arsenal of tools that is required to attempt to build a business in agriculture that, is, that can deliver both social and commercial value. Our vision at Farm Chakra is to build a modern, sustainable farming company that can innovate on better crops for the growing needs of our population. Farming is a very weird mix of deep science and lots of hope. And dreaming to make a big difference is the only fuel that keeps us going. Uh, thank you. So, catch hold of her, have those conversations with her. Loads to learn. Thank you, Shavya. Thank you.
Trisha and Eka Team from Kakriya Sandbox please come on stage to facilitate all the little performers. In case I'm missing out on any names, uh, request the team to help me with it. Right? Linka. Anyway, to check, check if I'm missing anybody. Go to call out somebody who's there in the audience with me a team, let me know. Because this is one thing that we don't want to miss. Believe me, the kind of intellect that is there in rural, even urban doesn't have. 
Latina. The only thing there is there are a lot of gaps in terms of how do we bridge them, but enough intellect is already there in rural. Why like, you know, explore a lot of challenges that are available in agri sector, education, employment, you know, or farmers. You know, what I commonly observe is the kind of supply chain gaps that are available, be it any segment to reach to the last mile is what I, you know, it touched me and that's where I started this. Model called Kesa. So today, what we do is we enable people who need many services today rather than they going to multiple places. You know, they can solve impl uh, uh, implement a lot of those interventions today at a scale if they you know all convert into reality. I think there's a lot of you know exposure that can be done. There are a lot of SHG women who come up with a lot of these you know doing their own programs where where like you know they can they solve multiple problems of their fellow women, you know people. But but fundamentally, you know, uh, the one point which probably my other panel uh, you know, guys also will uh, correlate is there is a lot of young entrepreneurship that is available in Bharat who otherwise would have become your Swiggy delivery boy or a Uber driver or a security guard. They are the potential people. And if we can create or give enough opportunities for them so that they can live in their own village, come put up their own house and you know, start earning. And that's what I call it as Arpanar Parvar. You want to add this? No, sure. Uh, firstly, thank you, Amsi, for starting and uh, thank you uh, to the organizers. It's lovely to be here and the vibrancy of entrepreneurship in Nizamabad has been so inspiring. It's my first uh, uh, visit to Nizamabad and I'm taking away a lot of inspiration, a lot of friends and a lot of uh, good memories. So thank you and uh, congratulations to all of you for hosting this. Uh, to your, uh, respond to your question, I think uh, this is an example of how you can uh, build that uh, entrepreneurship in Bharat. I would say with technology now, uh, the whole concept of Bharat being in rural areas or small towns, I think it's it's getting uh, more and more blurred. Uh, young entrepreneurs or social entrepreneurs, so I come from this organization called Ashoka which supports social entrepreneurs. We are a network of social entrepreneurs. And I also happen to work with a lot of youngsters who are starting very early and young in their lives. And I see the amount of ideas which are coming from uh, small uh, towns or I wouldn't even limit them to rural areas but uh, for instance tier two towns like Nizamabad has been so so uh, uh, inspiring to even uh, look at those ideas and there, there's a sort of sea change which is happening and that's why if we look at the theme of the conference technology is one of the main enablers which is helping these uh, young people because they are very tech savvy, everyone has a mobile device, many of them have laptops now and they are continuously using their creativity to solve problems and one of the beauties about our country is that we don't have birth of problems so how these young people from tier 2 towns or young entrepreneurs are converting those problems into an opportunity is a trend and uh, uh, we can talk more about it how uh, we have to shift and build it further but very exciting times and uh, I invite all of you to join that and support uh, this moment. So I'm going to ask Richa to talk a little bit about how you see technology kind of enabling entrepreneurship in Bharat. Uh, first of all, very delighted to be here actually. I'm meeting a lot of people after multiple years here in Nizamabad, which is great. Uh, it's great to see the vibrancy which is here. So I think, uh, you know, it's, it's great to see how, you know, I'd say internet is sort of penetrating in the deepest of the lands in the country, right? I mean, technology, how is it getting available? How is it being made available? And how people are consuming it? It's great to see uh, that, in a way, because of COVID, everybody has sort of adopted technology. Today, you can get mobile phones worth 1,000 rupees, smartphones, and you can get a data connection, right? So if somebody really wants to learn, there is no knowledge arbitrage that exists, right? And if somebody really wants to build something, they can build it irrespective from, you know, irrespective of the location because anything and everything that they need is available at a click of a button. Even if you want to understand or learn something and you don't know where to go to, you have your mighty mobile and data in it through which you can learn. So in the morning when the minister was talking about infrastructure, 
he was stressing on digital infrastructure, right? We've already started seeing that penetration, and that's the power, you know. I mean, the kind of penetration that we have in India, it's not there in any part of the world, right? So, we have this great advantage, and you know, we are a young country, so youngsters always hustle, especially, you know, a lot in tier 2, tier 3 cities. If you want to learn, you can learn, learn, and then you can use technology to scale it. That's why we are seeing so many examples of folks building in villages, rural areas, tier 2, tier 3 cities, and now selling those products on Amazon, Flipkart, right? So the market is becoming more accessible. You are seeing from any part of the country coming online and teaching, right? So if you want it, it is now available. And that's the role technology has played. And if the government continues to do what it's doing, you know, providing and building that digital infrastructure, we have truly hit it right. And therefore, you know, it's like not the decade, but the century of India. All this can propel us to be where we want to be collectively as Indians. That's, that's my view on technology. So, Richard, all that sounds really good. There was a kid last night at dinner, he seemed like 12 years old. He had a great uh, digital marketing idea, right? He wanted to kind of think about that and he said, Suresh sir, I just want to know how to build this product. Okay, how do you connect me to something? Isn't there a gap in the talent, in the expertise in Bharat versus the metros? And how do they fill that? Whatever you have said from a tech perspective, I agree with you. But when it really comes down to the nuts and bolts, they may not have access to the people. Okay, one thing, obviously, again, I will, you know, stress a little bit on technology. Today, people have become uh, more accepting of, you know, people reaching out, unknown people, right, old mailing. People have started responding to that, right? So, I would still say that, you know, most of the time, folks are shy, or they are thinking, should I write to that person, should I message that person, how will they react? The biggest lesson that I've learned as an entrepreneur is that ask for help. What will the other person do? The other person will either not respond or say no at the most, right? They are not going to kill you, right? So I think, you know, we were also talking about, you know, I understand there is a mentorship gap, but there are more than, you know, like plenty of people who are willing to give their time to support young entrepreneurs, right? only the endeavor that the individual has to do, reach out and ask for help. But yes, there are platforms like, you know, uh, it's happening at Kakatiya Sandbox. There is one happening in Hubli. There are multiple platforms, even institutions like HDFC Bank are running multiple platforms wherein they connect relevant mentors to young entrepreneurs, right? So, the basic tenet of entrepreneurship is to seek if you are seeking a business idea, you should also seek the right entrepreneur. And it works. You know, so you have to persevere to get the right entrepreneur. Right partners, right talent and so on. Is there a role for some of the larger institutes, which are in the metros, like the IIIT Hyderabad, having a more direct engagement with IIIT here, for sharing of talent, for kind of doing common projects, are there things like that which can actually change the world? Yes, in fact, some of the institutions are trying that. I am back is trying, ISB is also experimenting. Wherein the students studying, so to say, in the metro cities can act as a buddy or a senior, you know, trying to help, um, you know, young students in tier two, tier three cities and bridge that gap. So, you know, people are thinking in the right direction. They are trying it in silos. Um, it will be great if all of this can be brought together. But what I again want to stress is, don't shy, ask for help and you'll find it. Right? And use technology to enable that for you. And technology is now reachable everywhere. That's what my suggestion is. Okay. Can I ask Boxy to comment because he runs one of the largest rural super app, Akban Sanyar 
app, right? So how do you use technology box? Do you what is working for you and what is actually not working for you? So just to you know add up on the point what you said, like how this entire internet network or a digital network has actually you know kind of disrupted this entire space. What we're trying to build on top of it is a digital network. Where see like today it's it's not that you know hundred percent of the people in rural though they may have smartphones but they only consume data, they may not be able to do that. That's why we are creating an influencer network called Hesatis. And we have a program where our Hesatis who are from the remote villages, they join into our program, they start solving the problems for the end consumers, they start earning decent money, but after they pass at the threshold, they become a master of and you know train junior you know uh, 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 people or women from SNG network or second third generation farmers. Because they look at it, there are a lot of second third third generation farmers who are also moving away from farming, you know, and in terms of getting into some jobs or not. It's not that it is bad or something, but you know we all come from an agrarian you know, community, and it's always good to be connected with our grassroots. So coming to how this entire technology has kind of you know uh, changed is but our model, the way we would scale it. We are present in five states. We have 40,000 influencers who are actually helping 70 black rural consumers. You know, in terms of transacting various things. So again, as I said, I may not be able to use the technology the way an urban consumer may use it as a rural guy. But if there is someone who is actually solving on our behalf, and one thing which we also you know are doing it is for the first time we are doing we are launching a live video calling video commerce app where. Like you know, previously you used to have a telecommerce or something like that. This is a video commerce where the consumer in the village starts calling a video call and it connects to the influencer. And influencer actually do guiding various steps on the call itself the transaction happens. This is something you know which we are trying to build up. And there are a lot of rural examples where we work with a lot of micro entrepreneurs who come up with. In fact, I would like to take uh, you know names of Bihar, ESIC, who are actually you know doing a lot of programs in terms of bringing. A lot of those rural innovations are interventions. But I think what I believe is technology is fine. I mean, like, there are a lot of things happening, but anything, if, if it doesn't happen at a scale, I don't see that there is a large impact that is going to come. So, any impact without the scale is useless, is what I feel like. So, Yashwi, you are part of the largest social entrepreneurs, network, innovators. How are you using technology? What is working for the system, how do you motivate the social entrepreneurs to contribute and scale? Yes, what he said, you need to scale. And I think uh, scale is the challenge, and specifically in a country like India, I think uh, we are all uh, every day thinking about how technology can play. Uh, so uh, as, as an organization for us, technology plays a very important role because any network organization, uh, we have to map the needs of the social entrepreneurs of the overall sector, connect entrepreneurs who can work in, because it's not just a it's sum total of those, those efforts, but we also want to see how we can multiply uh, by facilitating a lot of collaboration. So one is that aspect of how do you get social entrepreneurs to con collaborate, to work together when technology plays a big role. The second which of COVID unfortunately uh, sort of forced us is also a lot of these relationship buildings also uh, could be facilitated through technology. And one of our learnings is, I think, uh, building this field of social entrepreneurship, we need a lot of role models for people to aspire to become entrepreneurs. The reason I think uh, I see a lot of excitement in Nizamabad because Fani uh, is a role model for uh, a lot of entrepreneurs here, Shabya and many other entrepreneurs who the last few years have inspired many more. So the same sort of how do you create that role modeling effect? in a particular community by celebrating social entrepreneurs. So that's one area where technology can play a huge role because you don't have to get everyone together in a physical setting and make that may not be even possible. But still, a lot of knowledge sharing, a lot of facilitation around connections, relationship building uh, is where knowledge uh, could play a role. And uh, these are some of the points, I think, uh, where uh, we can contribute. We'll come back to the next question of, you know, how to actually get them the cutting edge access, right? We are talking high level, but at the ground, on when you're doing a startup, you want access to the best technology and the cutting edge. Otherwise, you can't distinguish yourself. So, how do you do that? Let's pack that question. We'll come back. Maybe it's a cultural issue as well. So, from a culture perspective, do you see a difference between the culture in Bharat 
entrepreneurs versus the metro entrepreneurs, right? What is the difference in your mind and what should we do? How can we help? How can we help them scale? Yeah, so uh, as far as you know, my observation goes, uh, or our collective team experience goes, there is no turn for entrepreneurship. In, uh, in fact, I've seen more women entrepreneurs in rural than urban or towns. I mean, it's a fact. And I'll also like to uh, quote something here. The kind of intellect that is there in rural is like unimaginable. If you go to a village and if you find only one Kirana store, that means there is no business for second Kirana store. That's the kind of intellect is, which is all you know, the rural and they are like very smart enough. We think that you know we are smart enough, but you know, as I said. But now coming to women entrepreneurship, especially the cultural change, like most of the times the Kirana store may be on a husband's name, but it's it's the woman who you know, the business. We we are working with a lot of those SHG group men. You won't believe in, in, in districts. We are not as of now present in Nijambad, but I would like to come after seeing this entire thing. But we are very strong in Harimnagar, Varakal districts at all. Where 15 to 20 women come together, they set up a floor mill, they set up an oil mill, just for their two to three villages, and they want to earn a decent income from, you know, by setting up something on their own. That's the kind of an entrepreneurship which is there in rural. But coming to the cultural you know, point of view, as I said, it's more of not available, having a right available mentorship or right availability of technology or right availability of probably sometimes the, the access to funds, which is probably maybe you know not allowing them to scale. But I think culture-wise, I think they are there. It's just we need to just amplify by giving a lot of those tips and cuts. That can solve the problem. But Pamsi, this looks like a very standard answer to me. Yeah. So, really speaking, aren't the Bharat entrepreneurs a little bit more careful with money, a bit more conservative, a bit more cash flow positive, and all the venture investors want is market share and scale. They don't believe that this lady who's running this Kirana store can run 100 Kirana stores. So, how do we scale that? Yeah, so, I, I come from a background where, uh, you know, Unit economics is very strong. So until unless the unit economics doesn't work out, I mean, it's it's not a pure business sense. And I mean, completely agree to your point that they are very cautious enough or duty to actually make sure that it's a very strong unit economical model. And that's why the kind of interventions that were to come were not coming in because they were not ready for that radical cultural change, which could actually, which is already happening in urban or towns where. No, we are going for a valuation game or we are going for a scaling game and all. I don't think Bharat entrepreneurs know the valuation game. They, they are thinking how to sustain and generate cash flow. Do you agree, Richard? I agree. But Just before that, I was born in a village which has 200 houses. And I, I know the valuation. I mean, I may be an exception, but yeah. Uh, I think one of uh, the challenges I, I see in uh, what we are calling as uh, the Bharat, right, the places uh, uh, in rural India or tier two towns, I think the two biggest challenges. One, I think we do not end up celebrating a lot of failure. So as compared to say metros where I meet a lot of youngsters, they hustle with some startup, it doesn't work out. Still there is a lot of celebration, the parents encourage 